Thank you everyone for, and welcome to The Art of Giving. Uh, a few housekeeping items first. Today's class is going to be taped. So if you prefer to remain anonymous, you may wanna turn off your video. And the second little housekeeping item. Hello, Jeffrey, welcome. This workshop is made possible thanks to the Resilient Communities Fund grant from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. The Niagara Pump House Centre is able to offer free and paid art classes, workshops and lectures online, thanks to OTF. Uh, OTF is an agency of the Government of Ontario and one of Canada's leading granting foundations. They awarded $108 million to two, 629 projects last year to help build health healthy and vibrant communities in Ontario. So we thank them. So now our process for today is our guest speakers today are Jerry Kowalchuk, who I know a little. <laughs> she happens to be my husband. <laughs> Welcome, dear. And um, Jerry is an avid donor of charitable causes and offers his perspective on why he donates and the joy he derives from gifting wisely. Jerry will be followed by Paul Lalonde. CFP and CLU will present solutions on how to better allocate your financial resources between heirs, taxes, and charities to meet your individual goals. Following the presentations, we will hold a Q&A. To participate in the Q&A, we ask you to post your questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. So if you just take your mouse and just scroll down you'll see there's a little chat it'll open up and you can write your questions in and then I will ask them and appoint the questions to the, per the correct person at the end. Now for the more formal introduction allow me to introduce Jerry Kowalchuk. Jerry is a Niagara-on-the-Lake resident and donor to charitable causes he is passionate about. In 2014 Jerry established a donor advised fund through the Niagara Community Foundation to help underprivileged families and children. In 2019, Jerry approached the town of Niagara on the Lake with a proposal to fund the revitalization of the Mississauga Street and Queen Street entrance way to Niagara on the Lake. Today, we're gonna to find out why Jerry donates and the joy he, he derives from gifting wisely. So thank you, Jerry. And um, now that you, uh, I will let Jerry and Amy manage this screen. And Jerry, you're up. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you to my lovely wife, Lise, for the invitation. Uh, I did have an influence, I guess, on her. But uh, anyway, good <laughs> afternoon. For those of you who I don't know, um, my name is Jerry Kowalczyk, as Lise mentioned. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about this particular subject today. Um, I'm going to give you a bit about my background first. Uh, I was born and raised in Thunder Bay, originally Fort William and Port Arthur before they amalgamated. And um, I've done a lot of things in my life, but the two obvious ones, I was self-employed uh, for 21 years, uh, from 1975 to 1996. Um, I had two partners and we ran a, a real estate consulting analyst and valuation firm. And following that, I was invited into the financial services industry and I spent 13 years there from 1996 to 2008. Uh, I originally started with Midland Wallowin Capital. They got bought out by Merrill Lynch. They got bought out by CIBC with Gundy. And that's who I ended up uh, retiring with. So charitable giving is not a talk, a, a discussion thing that I've ever been asked to do before. And I thought I would uh, put my mind at play and uh, just indicate to you why I've even agreed to do this. Why even do it? Um, okay, so uh, the first thing I wanna tell you is my family and childhood were based on an exceptionally humble lifestyle. And I can't exaggerate that enough. We were not wealthy. And in fact, my father had to work two jobs to make ends meet. My mother didn't work. Um, so it was tough. And I, I am not complaining about it. I actually had a great childhood. 
I loved where I lived. I was active in a whole number of things, sports, and always had jobs and stuff like that. Um, but it, it affected my thinking, um, the frugality. I could see it in my family. Uh, my mom would send me to the store every day and I had to sign as a child, 12 years of age, for the groceries. And at the end of the month, my dad would pay them. So um, again, no complaints. Life has in fact unfolded very well for me. I feel very blessed. And I did not figure all of that out until I was about 40 years of age. I had been working, self-employed, <clears throat> and I began to notice from my own point of view how difficult. I, I didn't find my life difficult at all, but I was observing at that juncture at 40-ish that people had hardships due to things like health, like a lack of money, and without a, without a doubt, the inability to, to get ahead and to actually stay there, I could see it. Did I do anything about it? Not really, but a light kind of went on. So the reason I bring this to your attention is I think through my upbringing, I actually do have perhaps an above average appreciation for certain needs in society. So... I'll just put that aside now. And now the next part is what inspired me to get involved in philanthropy. I just told you what, how the light went on in, at 40, but at 50, I started now making observations. My career was more than established. I didn't have too much to worry about. My family was okay, I had two children, da 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 da, -da. And here's the observations that I made, some of which pertain to my work. You probably have heard of rent to gear, geared to income housing. Our company was instrumentally involved in tons of those things. We did them all over Northwest Ontario and uh, fringes going past Sudbury and what have you. And the provincial government would give us a needs list of people who were trying to get into facilities like that. So we were the advisors to the project over the course of about three years. And I can tell you, here's how it works. For somebody to get into there, they've got to have a bit of a hardship case. I knew that. And uh, I looked down their incomes, which were confidential. And I didn't pick the tenants, they did. Um, but people were making at that time, you've got to imagine this is 20 something years ago, between $800 per month and $3,000 per month. Now just think about that. Even if I gross that up, that's a fairly low amount. And I was quite surprised. I mean, it really, this was an observation I was making. And in that case, the rent would range from 200 to approximately $700 per month based on those parameters, that, that range. And all of us today, even if I gross that up for inflation, would say, boy, that's awfully cheap. And that's a good deal. But the fact is, that's all those people can afford. And there's a lot of people out there. Those waiting lists, my mother lives in Ina Grafton here, and it's partially subsidized. The waiting list to get into that building in St. Catharines is over seven years long. There's a huge lineup of people for buildings like this. So that's the first thing that influenced me. It was my involvement in these projects. And, and again, I'm just saying, geez, I guess I got it pretty good here as I'm looking at all this happening. The second thing is I started saving earlier for my kids' education. My parents could not afford to pay for my education categorically. And I figured that out when I was about 14 or 15. I never did ask them. I just knew that my dad, for what he was doing with two jobs, couldn't afford that. So I never, ever talked to them about it. Um, but here's what my observation was when I was 50. I reflected back on my past and I observed then and I still believe it's true today by the way that working and middle class families cannot I underline not afford to help their children at the upper end of the education spectrum so what do I mean by the upper end because a lot of people would get by through grants and and partial subsidies to get a bachelor's degree but if from the people I knew, and I, you know, and I knew a lot of people in Thunder Bay and that whole district, 
there's, I actually don't know of too many people that could afford to put two or three kids through university for a master's, a PhD, or a doctorate degree, when the combined costs over several, several years could range anywhere from $150,000 to $200,000. And again, I emphasize, I still believe that's true today. So I'm now starting to appreciate how life has unfolded for me. The third thing I observed is healthcare costs. And we all know we have universal healthcare and we're blessed that we do. I'm lucky to live in Canada. But a lot of people in society then when I was 50 and without a doubt today, the service industry don't have group benefit packages. And that's a huge benefit to have those, uh, those uh, perks if I can put that way. And again, I get back to working class, middle class families have great difficulty then, and I'm sure now, um, for expensive procedures. And I'll just use one as an example, specialized areas of dental work like implants, braces, oral surgery. And I had oral surgery with my oldest daughter. She cracked her front at age seven. And that carried me with her with various operations right through till about when she's 20. Um, it was very expensive. Fortunately, I was doing okay. And, um, but I asked myself many times, what do people do in a situation like that if they don't have a plan or what have you? Prescription drugs is another one. You know, we take that for granted if you have a group plan because you pay 10 or 15% and the rest is uh, absorbed by the company. But people who are service industry, for example, have to pay the full shot, 100%. And if they get sick and they have a lot of drugs, it's very costly. And the last thing is things like occupational therapy, glasses, and so on and so forth. So now I'm going to stop right here. And this is the one that did it to me. In December of 2012, it was a personal experience. I remember it vividly. I was with Lise. I was, I'd moved up here and my youngest daughter called me in December of 2012. She lives in Ottawa. And I'm gonna tell you the story in my own words. There was a girl she introduced me to in her backyard who worked for her when I visited her once. Her name was Debbie. <clears throat> so my daughter said, Dad, do you remember Debbie? I says, what Debbie? And she describes who, and of course, I'm not gonna mention the full name. She's got cancer and she was around 30 years of age. I says, oh my God. I says, how is she doing? He says, well, she's already stopped work. It's real serious, real serious dad. I says, oh my geez, does she have any kids? My daughter says she has three. And she says, you wanna hear the worst of it? What's that? She says, well, she, she split up with her previous husband a few years ago and she's remarried and she's trying to get custody of these kids and her ex-husband's making it difficult for her. And she's talked to her lawyer. The lawyer says, I know we can win this, but it'll take $5,000 or thereabouts to do it. And she doesn't have $5,000. So she's off work. She's got cancer, it's serious. She's trying to get possession of her kids. And I just listen and I don't say anything to my daughter. I don't say a thing. And she wasn't calling me to even contemplate this. She was upset about it, my daughter. So anyway, I said, so long. I got off the phone and Lisa and I sat down that night and I talked to Lisa about this. I said, listen to this, what I just told you. We both looked in the mirror, looked at each other and we said, let's help her. Lisa and I both did it. And we looked up her address because I knew roughly where she lived in Canada and what have you. And I sent, we sent her a check and uh, I didn't disclose it to my daughter. My daughter found out about three months later, uh, this Debbie told her, but that's, that's what triggered it. Lisa and I referred to that day as a random act of kindness. And it started influencing us. We would look for situations when we saw hardships and it could be minor, but it got me into that thinking in December of 2012. And then all of a sudden in 2014, I launched, as Lee said, my own fund 
through the Niagara Community Foundation. It's called the Gerald Kowalczyk Family Fund. And Amy, if you'll turn the slide, please, or, or to the wording of that fund, yeah. So I wanna, I'm gonna emphasize, I, I drafted this. So this is called a donor advised fund. And what that means is I wanna pick where it's going and who I wanna help. It's called donor advised. I advise the Niagara community. They told me about this. I liked it, it appealed to me. So I'm gonna read, it's helping children and people. And I'm now emphasizing who are underprivileged and disadvantaged due to a lack of financial resources and who are, and I stress this, worthy. I did not want to help drug dealers or somebody who's just got a, out of jail or something. I was not looking for that. And who are likely to succeed, but lack the resources and support to go forward. And then I gave it a broad spectrum that it could be education, healthcare, well-being, food, nutrition, or even a sport if they excelled. So that's when I formally got into it. And that's kind of the story from my youth to there. Um, Amy, if you'll turn the slide, please. But since I'm doing this today, that I enlighten you, and I actually didn't know this till I prepared for this. There was a, 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 a survey done or a study by Forbes magazine in 2019. It says, which countries have the greatest number of people donating to charities. And they listed the top 10. And Canada is number 10. I'm impressed with that. The United States is not even in this list. So 63%, you know, the top one is 81. But I mean, we're 10th. So I gather, reading this, that Canadians like to help charitable causes. Um, for the record, yesterday I, I reintroduced that study. I looked it up again, and we're now number six as of 2021. So Canadians deserve a pat on the back. Next slide, please. I'm going to do, do a bit of this for a moment. Um, this was done uh, purely in Canada now, analyzing our makeup. And I just want to bring to your attention uh, the top left hand square, 84% of Canadians donate to some cause. Now, it doesn't matter how much it is. That's a big percentage of the population, 84% of the public donate in Canada. Again, something to be very proud of. So it's obvious uh, they're capable of uh, identifying needs. And under the expression of the bottom where it says why they give, I'm only gonna mention one to you. The very first one where it says 89%. The reason they give is, and I agree with this, this is what inspires me, is they feel compassion for those in need. It's that simple, that simple. And I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the situations I've countered momentarily. Next slide, please. This, Amy split this slide in two, the last one and now, just so that they're a little larger. So this is an interesting one. The biggest bulge of our Canadian population that donates is the age bracket from 35 to 44. One right in the middle there, where it says 89%. Yep, yeah. that's the biggest percentage of people who give, and they, on average, give $431. The... Um, People who apparently give the most are people like myself. They're over 65 at the bottom. Um, you know, anybody over 65, the, the number, of course, now most people are retired. They're looking to maybe help out as they age and so forth. Eh? So as I read all this, again, very proud to be Canadian, to see that we're givers, you know. Okay, so let's now move to the next slide, which is how do you create your legacy. So I've created this diagram and your legacy is you. You can call it what you want. You can call it your name. You don't have to call it anything. You can just do something. There's numerous ways to participate. On the left-hand side there in gold, all these boxes are community foundations. And I will tell you they're everywhere. I told you I was born and raised in Thunder Bay. There is a Thunder Bay Community Foundation. Lisa and I lived in Burlington. There's a Burlington Foundation. We lived in Oakville. There's one in Oakville. There's one in Hamilton. They're everywhere. 
There is one here, the Niagara Community Foundation. So that is a real obvious one. Um, and again, I did something different with them that some people do, but you can just basically contribute to a multitude of causes, which again, I'll discuss momentarily here. In the middle <clears throat> are the banks, the green box. They're all into this. They have dedicated divisions where they'll set you up for uh, whatever charitable uh, thing you wanna do. They've got guidelines on it. Um, now it's obvious why they're doing this as banks. These are big pools of money collectively coming in from society and they wanna manage that money. So I do understand why they're, they're not doing it philanthropically themselves. There is a cost to it, but every, every money manager has to get paid anyway. Um, not right now, but in a moment, I'll, I put on slides the websites of three prominent banks in case you want to look them up because they have a quick link where you can go and they'll, you'll see how they're structured. And then there's one on the right side that I identified in a box called Canada Gives. And we'll just go to that slide now. It's on the next page. You'll see Canada Gives with the maple leaf. Oh, pardon me. It's first the banks. Yeah. So the top one is CIBC, who I used to work for. The middle one is TD. And uh, the bottom one is RBC, Wealth Management Division. And again, you see they all have subheadings about private giving or charitable giving. They're actually very well done, their websites. I, I was impressed when I looked them over. Uh, so if you can go to the Canada Give slide, which is next, then any please, yeah. So this is uh, an independent one run by a board of directors. I'm not bringing this to your attention to uh, necessarily target or what have you, but it's well run. Uh, all the trustees on it have a fiduciary responsibility under the Trustees Act. And the only reason I flagged it is in the top right-hand corner, it says start a plan start a plan. So if you were inclined to want to see what they do, you just click on that button, just like the banks. So I'm giving you resources in the event you want to quote, think about this. And the next slide, I've shrunk a map of Canada down and I shrunk it into parts of Ontario. And I want to tell you why I did that. Every time you shrink the map, more community foundations come up. So this is a map of all the community foundations in Canada, but I only have one little bird's eye view and at the top left on Lake Superior is my hometown, Thunder Bay. And I actually did consider doing my donor advised fund with the Thunder Bay Community Foundation. It had crossed my mind. I looked it up. There's one in Burlington. I looked at that as well. Lisa and I used to live in Oakville. And right at the very bottom, you'll see Niagara uh, as the bottom dot. So I ended up going with Niagara for several reasons. First of all, I live here and I'm not leaving. Lisa and I have said, this is the nicest place we've ever lived in our life. And uh, essentially I'm retired here and I will be buried here. It's that simple. But the interesting thing I found about in the interviews with these community foundations is even though I have my uh, dealings with the Niagara Community Foundation, if in fact I identified a cause in Thunder Bay or Sunbury or anywhere in Canada, and it's a charitable cause that's uh, governed under federal legislation, I can tell the Niagara Community Foundation to allocate this year's funds to that cause. So I didn't feel a need to go to my hometown. I felt I'll just deal roughly where I live and they do a relatively good job. Again, you'll hear me talk about that as well. So there is no slide on what I'm gonna to talk to you about now. Um, uh, I'm gonna just shoot uh, from the hip on this in a way, but uh, if, if you have an inkling that you wanna consider this, the first step you should be considering in my view, because I've been through the mental process now is, well, who would you like to support? What areas? 
uh, would you like to support? And there's housing and homelessness. There is environment. So like the Bruce Trail uh, has a tax exempt status where you, know, you can contribute to the Bruce Trail. I, I know somebody who's put in their will a certain amount of money, money for the nature conservancy to preserve natural wetlands and stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff you can do in the environment. There's international aid. And I do feel obligated to tell you this interesting story about international aid. I have three grandchildren and one of them just turned a teenager this last month or so, but when they were smaller, like five to eight, um, I came up with this idea internationally that people in Ecuador are very poor. And I read how you can help these children whose parents, uh, sometimes they don't have parents. And Lisa and I actually did this together. There was a little boy named Danny and they had a photo of him and he was about five or six. And his parents had died and they were living in basically substandard, like no running water in the house and stuff like that. And for, I can't remember the amount, it's irrelevant. It's a very modest sum. You could adopt that child for a year and the child will write to you every three months and tell you what they're doing, what it's bought for them, whether it's food on the table or what have you. So in my case, I asked that charity, could we put this in my grandkids name and they get the letters and that's what we did. And the reason being is my grandkids were getting these letters from a, a kid their age. And I used to say to them, the reason I did this, you guys, is you live a pretty good life with your mom in Ottawa and um, things are good for you, but not all children have it that way. And we only did it once, but I think it left a mark on them. And you'll hear me talk about my oldest daughter in a minute, how, uh, how she's been influenced with this. So there are fundraising organizations you can just plain donate to. The Canadian Cancer Association is one of them. You can contribute to healthcare causes. The obvious one today with an aging population is the Alzheimer Society. Um, I identified one and one of us, one of, the, one of you in the crowd will know why I put this down because um, it surprised me when I saw it this week is the Canadian Orthopedic Foundation. And I didn't know they exist until I read that. Um, there's youth uh, needs for education, for employment, Big Brothers Association, Scouts Canada, social services like the Children's Wish Foundation, YMCA. So again, I have a donor advised fund where I've been specific. I haven't picked a cancer association or a child poverty thing or what have you, but I just want to wrap my head around the fact that I, it took time for me to digest how do I want to go about this and who do I want to help. So that's a soul searching exercise. Um, I'm still continuing this only I'm going to migrate a bit to the actual NAG Community Foundation right on their website. And again, I didn't do it, but they actually have funds they've created, which are to people who just want to play and help that. So I'll name a couple. There is a Caring Children and Youth Fund. There is an Education and Leadership Fund. So for education for, uh, for uh, students and what have you. An Environmental Legacy Fund. Health and Well-Being. Even Cultural Endowment. So lots to pick from. There is no such thing as a big contribution or a little one. It, the, the terminology is anything. They take any contribution. It can be $50, 100, 500, 5,000. So I'll just stop there. That's available to everybody. And just tell you that this donor advised fund that I set up, one of the stipulations of it is because it's specific, to me, I said, this is the type of segment of society that I'd like to address. And they said, no problem. We have a lot, a lot of donor advised people who want something that means a lot to them. And they said, so Jerry, they said, in order to set that up, you have to open it with a minimum of $25,000. And that's what I did. I've added to it each year. 
So it isn't a $500 contribution or a hundred, and I'm not obligated to put 25,000 in a year. I only have to start it with 25,000. Some years I put in more, others I put in less. And they invest those monies and then they send me a letter each year. In fact, it's due in May. I talked to them this week, this week and they say, here's the value of your fund. And uh, cause it's invested in a whole pile of things, bonds and everything else. And they usually use a drawdown rate of approximately four or 5% because they want this money to last in perpetuity. So in theory, I'll be gone, long gone, and this fund will still exist 50 to 100 years from now. So that's how you create a legacy that it goes on and on. We'll now move to a slide, and I call it other items to consider. And the first one is, it's obvious, every little bit helps. It's just that simple. Um, I think there's a misnomer in uh, contributing to a cause where, you know, we're, uh, to exaggerate it, Bill Gates is ultimately at the top end there. But I think when people talk about foundations and legacies, they envision that they have to put in, you know, a million dollars plus. That's not true. I just told you that, uh, that you can contribute 150, but if you want to do a donor advice fund, it's 25,000 and you're not obligated to do anything after that. Um, so every bit helps. Um, I do want to tell you that since the money's invested, um, that I took a great interest in that when I interviewed three foundations. Since I was in the investment business with Wood Gundy, uh, I made a point of asking a lot of questions about that. And what I found out in the case of the Niagara Community Foundation is they joint ventured with the city of Hamilton, which was larger and they've got institutional pricing. So what does that mean? That's as cheap as you can get. That's like getting a pension fund to manage your money for you. That is very, very good. So I was hugely influenced because if in fact, to exaggerate this, I interviewed a foundation and they were gonna charge 3% a year or something to manage this money versus a fraction, well under 1%, well under like half of 1% or what have you. That makes a huge difference to me because over time that's an extra two to two and a half percent going back into uh, growth in these investments, which allows the fund that I've set up uh, to contribute more. So I would be asking questions about institutional pricing and they'd be happy to answer that. They're very, very cooperative with this stuff. Um, the other thing I'm gonna tell you is, um, uh, I'm, I'm down on the third one on this page, Amy, is you, you can involve other family members. And I have my oldest daughter in with this, uh, on, with, with me. I put, it, put her on paper and writing with me with the Niagara Community Foundation. And every year, her and I meet to go over our requests. Um, so if you feel it would be beneficial for one or more of your children or your grandchildren, what have you. I do believe it's a huge advantage and you'll hear me talk about that uh, momentarily again, yeah. Next slide, please. So you can establish your fund today and donate when you die. Now I know Paul's gonna talk a bit about this, so I'm not gonna get carried away, but you can create a legacy in your will is that's all I'm telling you. You know, you, it could be part of your estate planning Below that, the next point, Amy, I have signed, and it's simple. I don't want you to think this is confusing. It's called an innovation agreement with the Niagara Community Foundation. My lawyer is well aware of it. <clears throat> he said to me, that's the best thing you could do because he says, you're the type of guy that'll change your will every five years or so because I do think of things and, and if, if there's a method of improving, I think about it. So uh, he says, with an innovation agreement, he says, you do it with the community foundation. It basically says, should I die? Here's how I want this money to be invested. And if I wanted to help these causes or whatever, again, I'm, I can get specific about things, but it doesn't, if my will changes, I don't have to change the innovation agreement. It just goes forward. So it covers me once I do it once. So all of this stuff is kind of taken care of for you. It's actually, on cruise control, if I could put it that way. And the last point here, Amy, please. Yeah. 
everything is done for you through a community foundation. And I suspect through a bank too, because I work for them. I know how they operate. Uh, so they do the investment management, you know, and I told you we've got institutional pricing. They calculate the yearly charitable allowance that I can allocate to people in need. You get current values of your holdings every year. Um, uh, honestly, it's, uh, it, it runs, I, I don't have to spend any time. I do have a binder. I put interesting things in there for a reference, but uh, it's very easy and efficient and far more so than had I pounded my chest and said, I'm going to set up my own foundation. Very expensive, you need legal fees, accounting fees, not worth doing. So we're getting close to the end. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to now uh, start slide down here and telling you what the benefits to me have been. And I'm also going to give them to you in order, in order. What has it really meant to me to do this? First of all, number one, this is the obvious one. The first one is um, you're helping people in need. I just can't say enough about that. It's an emotional experience that I never thought I'd realize. So every year when my daughter, my oldest daughter uh, and I get together and she hasn't come here this year because of COVID, but we'll sit down for a couple of hours. I send her the stuff in Edmonton before she gets here. She says, oh, Dad, that's incredible. You know, we have these 10, 15 people that, you know, the Community Foundation gave us need assistance for some reason. Eh? So much so that it's hard to make a choice sometime. You know, uh, we get emotional about it, and we usually try and narrow it down to two or three worthy candidates. They're all worthy, by the way. But it's very emotional when you feel you can't help them all. It's that simple. So it's meant a lot to, uh, to both my daughter and I, you know. Um, the number two one is uh, it's added meaning to my life. There is no question. I'm retired now. I'm not lazy. I'm not bored, but it's given me a fuller life. I feel I have a sense of purpose. I can't emphasize that enough. I, I enjoy, uh, I don't enjoy reading about hardship, but I enjoy when I can have a small effect and you'll see how, how I'm going to end this, what small really is. A small effect can make a huge difference in a person's life. So I, I do have a sense of purpose. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it uh, can definitely promote a sense of giving if you involve your children or your grandchildren. In my case, I've involved my oldest daughter. You know, she has never said this to me, but I can see it. She is on top of this every year. Like she says, remember when we gave to such and such and we'll be, she said, did I ever feel sorry for that person? You know, and da, 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 da. she participates and because she's a teacher and we've had requests from the educational division, she has good insights, which are way better than mine when it comes to making decisions. And I actually rely on her when she, she when I'm reading hard, I says, well, how would you see that in your school? And anyway, she's been invaluable to me. Number four is um, every little bit helps. So again, I got to eliminate the rumor that you need 10, 20, 100,000. No, you don't. $100, 50, 500, 5,000, whatever suits you. Even the average of citizens I showed you was about four or $500, you know. And the last one is, and I put it last because it is not my priority, you get a tax deduction. And I know Paul's going to talk about this. It is a benefit, but it is not top of my list. I'm kind of thankful. To me, it's an indirect benefit. I didn't do it for that reason. So that's how it's affected me. And um, I now want to read you. Uh, I can't remember if I, yeah, okay. So just leave the envelope. Uh, I'll read this to you as you're reading it. We were, we were called, not called, but we got the, a memo from the Community Foundation a few years ago. And they, they gave our cause to the Education Foundation of Niagara. And they, they had asked for help with 10 students of different jurisdictions. It was all schooling stuff. I want to read you this letter. I get emotional about it. And my daughter and I knew we were going to choose three and four, three poor people. Dear Mr. Kowalczyk, I wanted to take a few minutes to formally thank you for the generous donation you made towards my schooling supplies. 
To give you some background, I am currently at Fanshawe College as a diesel technician. I feel extremely lucky to be given this donation towards my building. The support and care that you have shown is amazing. I'm proud to say that I'm grateful that you have chosen me to help. I know that the generous donation, or you should know that the generous donation will not be unnoticed or forgotten. I'm glad to say that the donation is going towards a pair of safety glasses and my school books, which will be put to great use, not just in school, but in the workforce I'm entering. Mr. Kowalczyk, I could not thank you enough for the donation you have given me. I look forward to the day that I will help a student just like you did. Now, I want to emphasize to you, we chose a student who bought books and safety glasses. It was a trades thing. This was a very modest donation, but it impact on this young person's life dramatically. There was a lot of hardship. I can't remember the exact situation, whether one of the parents died or what have you, but that stuff is really soul searching when you realize how blessed you are to, to be able to give. So anyway, with that, um, I will conclude by um, wishing you all the best, particularly if you embark on a charitable journey. And I will be happy to answer any questions you may have following Paul Lon's presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Well done. <laughs> nice job. Thank you very much. And now that you are inspired to give, allow me to introduce you to Paul Lalonde. Paul is notable for having achieved both his CFP and his CLU designations. And take it from me as a retired CFP, the latter of those is very, very difficult to achieve and was beyond my skill set. So uh, Paul is in an excellent position to tell us exactly how to best uh, go about making donations in a um, um, tax efficient and wise, wise way that has outcomes, positive outcomes for everyone, um, and including your uh, estate and while you're alive. So thank you, Paul, for agreeing to come and speak to us today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very hey, much. Hey, uh, thank you, Jerry. Um, somebody's got a mute or something. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. So um, thank you very much. I mean, Jerry, you said you said a whole lot there. And um, I agree with you on so many levels as far as that. It's not the amount that matters. Um, but that, you know, that last advantage that you did say, you know, the tax, the tax receipt. And I know Canadians like to give, and we also don't like to be recognized for it. And oftentimes I've done a lot of fundraisers and I see people saying, you know what, oh, I don't need a tax receipt. You offer a tax, oh, I don't need it. Because we don't want to feel like we're doing it for our own selves. And I'm saying to you right now, everybody here, take the tax receipt because it means you can give more. All right. Do it to be able to give more. So I've been very fortunate um, having been involved with um, many charities and um, you know doing financial planning as, as, as Lise has done. So we're very uh, you know very similar in that sense. But the idea of my talk today is to kind of give you an idea of certain strategies. I mean, I could talk all day about different strategies because there's a million ways to skin a cat, but we'll talk a little bit about the issues that are happening right now. And essentially when we're talking about charitable giving right now, the greatest transfer of wealth is about to take place. I mean, we've got the baby boomers who have accumulated a lot of assets and we're about to, to basically transfer it. And that's really gonna shape the landscape of our future generation. You know, whether we give it all to our kids or give it to some charities of people who need it, um, there's all types of people who say, I don't wanna give my kids too much. You know, I want them to work for it. Um, there are ways of setting things up and every single person will have a different priority and a different way of looking at how much do I want to give to my family? How much do I want to give to charity? What do I want to be remembered by uh, and by who, you know? And for the, for the essence of the talk, um, I'll be talking to um, well-to-do people. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I imagine that most people watching this are people who, you know, either have thought about charitable giving or on a, on a big scale or even on a little scale, every bit counts, but these are just like a, a macro um, view of this. So, Having said that, I mean, um, right now in today's world of pandemic, there's a new reality for charities. I mean, 
it's going to be much tougher. So in this talk, I'll be talking quickly about the realities that they're looking at. How do we maximize the power of giving with certain different strategies that we can look at? And in a nutshell, many people are finding that we have money to live, we've got money to give, and we've got money to leave. And how do we maximize that to reflect our values, our, our needs, and our wants, um, so that we can feel like we've lived a life of significance, like Jerry said. It certainly adds to um, the later stages in life and what you've achieved and been able to do for other people. So right now, we're in a tough position for all charities. I mean, we saw that Canadians are, are charitable by heart, uh, by, by nature, pretty much we're raised to be upstand, upstanding uh, people. But as unemployment rises and, and financial difficulties um, happen are happening to people, the ability to donate are going down and many charities are feeling the effects of that. A lot of fundraisers, and I'm heavily involved with the, the Rotary Club, and I mean, our uh, holiday house tour, which generates a fair bit amount of money, we had to cancel it this year. So these are things that are gonna limit how we're gonna be able to give. So everybody's being affected. Um, charities are having resources taken away to go towards other things. And many, you know, many charities, kind of like a lot of businesses, are struggling to survive and do the good works that they do. So, in a nutshell, you know, there's never been a, 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 a better time to give because it's never been more needed than now. So, um, as I said, you know, Jerry, I, I applaud you for what you're doing, taking a a proactive approach to it, and um, you know, it's it's great. I wish more people did it. So, one of the questions I often get, just really quickly, is you know, how much can you donate? I mean. A lot of people give to RSPs and tax-free saving accounts, and, and there's always limits to that. And um, again, we're talking about um, estate planning, charitable giving on a bigger scale. Well, the fact is on a yearly basis, the government gives you pretty good incentive. They can give you 75% of your net income in a year or on the year of death. So we're talking about estate planning, up to 100% of income can go towards charitable giving. So it's a lot higher than RSP contributions and tax free saving accounts limits. It's very significant what you can do. So really, you know, while you can't completely avoid, you know, death and taxes, you, the government at least gives us an incentive to be giving and they see the value in us and, and having their own citizen give to other causes because it also takes a load off them too in, in certain respects. So um, here I'll be talking quickly because I don't have all the time in the world on a few quick strategies. One will be donations in time, life insurance gifting, and then using RIF or CPP, old age security, or, or other income sources to um, be able to, to give more to not just your family, but to charities. And I'm gonna start off with donations in time. So a lot of people may not realize this, but um, I'm gonna quickly explain to you what donations in kind is. So most people who give a donation in Canada basically write out a check and they basically give it to the charity and that's basically it. Donations in kind is taking a different approach to it where you're taking money that you've, you've grown over the years. So it, it involves non-registered money. So cash money or investment that you made that were not in RSPs or in, um, or in tax-free savings accounts, but that come from publicly traded shares, mutual funds, or segregated funds. And especially if you've had them for a long time and you decide to donate those shares, instead of the money, you donate those shares to a charity, um, what will happen is a couple of things. Is number one is you will get a tax receipt for that fair market value. And just so you don't get lost, I will be showing you the difference between the two and the next slide. But essentially, for the example I'll be using, I'm just saying you guys are doing really well and you decided to give a big gift of $100,000 to charity. If you donated $100,000 in cash or in the donations in kind, you will get a tax receipt for $100,000, which will make a huge impact on your, on your, on your, the taxes owing at the end of the year. But the advantage of doing it in kind is that not only do you get a tax receipt, you avoid paying the capital gains on the full amount on the shares that you donated. And this will, you know, I think of people who, let's suppose you've had a, a, a Bell stock for a long time, for example, and that's grown significantly. Or as of last week, you know, GameStop, you had bought it early on and it shot up to the roof and you made all this money. If you, had, if you had cashed out at its peak, um, you would have a huge tax bill owing. But here's the difference. If we do a side-by-side -side here, and what you'll see here is a cash donation on this side. And I'll just say that you had bought the stock at really mutual fund at $20,000, and you've had it for a really long time because you're a saver and you, you're well-to-do and you haven't needed the money. So this money has grown and grown and grown. And basically you say, you know what? I want to give $100,000. It's worth $100,000 now. Um, I can cash that 
securities out and write a check for $100,000, or I can give the shares instead. And on the left side, you'll see here that from the $20,000 that you put into it and the $100,000 that you took out of it, you would be late looking at an $80,000 capital gain on that. Um, and then half of that would be subject to taxation. So in a marginal tax rate, if you just wrote a check out um, from that fund, you would basically be looking at paying $16,000 in tax, which is fairly significant. By actually donating that money to directly without actually cashing it out, just saying here are the shares to a charity and it's easy to do, um, you would get the $100,000 tax receipt, the capital gains would be there, but guess what? You don't have to pay for it. So in a nutshell, you've done the same thing, but you've saved an extra $16,000. So by giving the same $100,000 to charity, you're saving an additional $16,000. Now think about what you could do with that $16,000. It could pay for a nice vacation, or it could be a nice gift to your kids or your grandkids, but if you wanted to, you could actually give more with the same amount of money and you end up further ahead. So it's about being smart with your money. And, and if you're looking at doing that, you can look at the different assets you have and figure out which one makes the most sense to give. Um, is it a check? Is it you know a registered money? Is it money that's non-registered that's grown significantly? You can determine what is the best thing for you and every circumstance is different, but it's a good idea to know that if you can have, and you do have stocks or mutual funds that you've had for a long time and have grown in value, those are really good gifts or a really good place to start as far as giving your money away to causes that are close to your heart and make a difference to you. So that's donations in kind, and I'll be taking questions after if you guys have any, but um, that's just kind of a quick idea. Um, is it hard to do? Absolutely not. Really, the big thing is talking to your charity that you want to do it because you want to make sure that they're aware that they're going to get this and that they're, they're able to do it. And then you want to talk to the advisor of the institution you deal with. Um, some institutions do charge um, minor fees. Oftentimes, it's like a transfer fee of the funds. Um, it just depends. It is an important thing to find out. Um, our, my, like our company doesn't charge anything for that. I mean, we want to encourage that type of behavior. So um, any costs associated to it are, are, are looked, looked aside and it just means that more is going to charity. So it saves you more in taxes for the same amount, allowing you to give you more. So it's really one of those things that is a win-win and it allows you to make a bigger difference if you wanted to with the same amount of money. So it's a really great way to, to do things. And um, I encourage everybody who who does have that and is thinking of doing that to look into it and find out more. So the next area real quick is using different tools that are available to us. And I mean, I've been in the industry now for, uh, I can't believe it, over 20, geez, 22 years almost. Um, and um, I still feel young. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, having said that, I've, I've had the, the pleasure and the opportunity to actually make um, donations on behalf of people through life insurance and using that tool as a gift. And I mean, at the end of the day, for most people that, I'm, that are here, you know, um, you can't take it all with you. And the last check that you bounce, the, the last check that you write is probably not gonna bounce. So, you know, we like to be worried about what's gonna happen when we pass away. Am I gonna run out of money? Fact is, is that the fact that you think that way is usually means that you're not gonna run out of money because you're, you're prudent, you're smart. With your money. So that generation of saving is, is often you know, pumped into you and it doesn't go away as soon as you retire, you don't start growing at all. Once you save your whole life and you've gotten to a point of saving, it's really hard to change your mindset to go into a spending mindset. So you're typically gonna only accumulate assets and if they do go down, they're not going to run fast enough. So oftentimes I look at life insurance as the 1% solution as far as estate planning, as far as protecting the estate. Um, you're taking 1% of your assets to protect to protect the other 99%. Um, and you really, um, you know, I often call life insurance sometimes the 1% solution because as an example, um, if you were looking for a $250,000 60 year old couple, last to die, that premium is $3,400 a year. And it means that you're putting essentially 1.4% a year aside to pay out $250,000 tax-free. So I rounded down because you just round things to the closest number and it's a 1% solution. You're putting 1% aside to basically offset um, money down the road. So it's, it's a great way to, um, to maximize. And I always go back to people, you know, we talk about like Jerry, when you're looking for a charity, you're not looking for a charity that has high administration costs, is not really efficient, is not doing the things you want it to do. And it's the same thing when you go invest your money, you don't go to the bank or 
to the, your financial advisor and say, give me the lowest rate possible. I want the worst performing fund. The fact is, is we're always looking to maximize our money. And um, that's the same thing when you do charitable giving. That's why donations and kinds make so much sense. It's the same thing with life insurance as far as estate protection and, and also donations. And now we're gonna talk about using um, excess cash flow. I have a lot of clients who, you know, who've done well throughout their life and all of a sudden they hit an age category. But if they hit, you know, certain thresholds where they're like, geez, I gotta take old age security. I don't really need the money. Um, I gotta take CPP, I don't want to. 71 years old, the government's obligating me to take my RIF pay, uh, my RSP and turn it into a RIF and take that money out. I don't really need it. What happens with that? Um, the other issue too with that, especially like registered money is that it creates a huge tax liability for some people. You know, if you've got a million dollars in RSPs um, and something were to happen to you and your spouse tomorrow, like half of that's going to the government. I hate to tell you, you know? So this money that you thought was going to be for your nest egg and for for other things is going to be used for things that you didn't really kind of sign on for. So, um, so what happens with this is that we can use some of that excess cash flow to either fund insurance or go to charities. It, there's really way, a lot of ways to skin a cat. But what I'm going to show you is, is a strategy that I think is pretty neat because it's a win-win-win for everybody, for your family, for the charity, and for also yourself as far as knowing that your money will be maximized and go to the things that are important to you. And at the end of the day, if you do it right, only the tax man loses. So this is a fun example. So I'll look at the do nothing approach, which is what a lot of people do. And we'll say, we'll say, you know, we'll take away the houses and any other assets, but we'll just say that when you both pass away, there's a $250,000 RIF that you haven't spent and you did nothing. Well, what happened is, is that now that would go through the, you know, through probate legal, through the will. And um, that, 200, that $250,000 in RIF would be added to your income for that year which means that at the end of the day, if you did nothing, your kids would essentially get about $150,000 and the government gets about $100,000. So I don't know how you feel about that, but let's take a look at an alternative for you. So let's suppose we diverted that excess cash flow and bought a $250,000 life insurance policy and we bequeath the, the, the money in your RIF to a charity. What would happen now? So to start off is, so we're looking here, and that $250,000 is, is the, the, the cash flow from that is buying a life insurance policy. And if you, pa if you pass away, what'll happen is that life insurance, $250,000 will be paid out 100% tax free to the kid. And then you bequeath the charity to the, the, the RIF to the charity. And what happens is, is the, tax, the charity will issue a tax receipt for that full amount. And as I showed you earlier, you can claim 100% of income on your taxes on the year of death. Therefore, um, the tax receipt will offset any taxes owing. So at the end of the day, the charity gets $250,000, which is fantastic. But what's even better is your kids don't feel like you shortchanged them. They still get $250,000. And your kids and the government and the person that you probably would least want to have the money gets nothing. So it's a way to bypass. Now, I'm not saying avoid taxes. I mean, we've all done it throughout our lives. But you know, if I gave you a list of, and I said, you know what, who would you prefer to get your money? The government, lawyers, accountants, or no offense to you, Ron, we love the accountants there. <laughs> uh, but having said that, or would you prefer have your children, your grandchildren, or your favorite charities? The fact is, is that I know that if I gave this a, a, a list here to you guys or a survey, I'm pretty sure I can hit it with 100% accuracy who those people are going to be that you're going to want to have the money. So it's just a way of using certain tools that are available. And there's a lot of ways. I mean, some people who have a yearly donation say, you know what, I give $1,000 to the same charity every year. Well, what if you bought a life insurance for $1,000 a year instead and made them the charity uh, and made them the beneficiary? Um, you could do it where instead of, you know, getting a tax receipt, at the end of the day, there'll be the wing of a hospital named after you. You know, the, it'll be something more significant. You can even do it where, you have the charity, even though you give $1,000 a year to the same charity, you buy a life insurance policy on yourself and you make that charity the, the owner of that contract. And then you pay for that policy to stay in force. You will get your annual tax receipt for that. Your estate will not get the tax receipt. But if you prefer, because you say, you know what, I don't have any kids that I really don't care. I'd rather enjoy the savings now. You can do it that way too. So there's a lot of different strategies you can use. And I want to like finish this off here. I think Jerry, actually, you kind of stepped on this as far as the example that you can make. You know, here we are, 
how do we want to leave this, this legacy transfer, you know, this wealth transfer? And how do we expect our kids, you know, to know the experience unless we show them? And we go back, you even mentioned Bill Gates. You know, when Bill Gates decided to be this philanthropist, what happened? It, it, he was kind of a, a snowball effect where other, other billionaires or other people of value said, you know what, I want to do the same thing. So Warren Buffett joined in. And by leading by example, you know, on a large scale, on a medium scale, or on a small scale, we kind of create the society that we want to live in. We make the impacts that we want to make and we maximize financially how much we can help, how much we can do. And the well-to-do and the well-meaning can, can really have an impact on this generation, the next generation, and for, you know, what's going on right now. So again, um, get that tax receipt. Uh, you know, I could go on and on and on, but I'll leave it there. And I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, I hope I didn't go too fast, but if you have any questions, uh, let me know. So thank you very much. I'll pass it off back to, to Lee's there and we'll go from there. Well, thank you.